Pharmacokinetics refers to the movement and modification of medication inside the body. Or more simply, it's what the body does to this medication and how it does it. Okay, first things first. A medication needs a way to be administered, or a route of administration. Depending on the form of the chemical preparation, like a pill, solution, spray, or ointment, and the part of the body being treated, the medication can be administered through various means or routes, such as swallowed by the mouth, orally, injected into a vein, intravenously, injected into a muscle, intramuscularly, inhaled into the lungs, sprayed into the nose, nasally, or applied onto the skin, cutaneously. All right. So once the medication is administered, it first has to be absorbed into the circulation, then distributed to various tissues throughout the body, metabolized or broken down, and finally eliminated or excreted in the urine or feces. You can remember this as ADME, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. Why don't we start with absorption? Absorption is the process of moving the medication from the site of administration into the circulation. With the exception of intravenous administration, a medication will need to cross one or more cell membranes before it reaches the circulation. Movement across the cell membrane can occur via passive transport, which requires no energy, and active transport, which does require energy in the form of adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. There are two types of passive transport, facilitated diffusion and passive diffusion. Facilitated diffusion helps larger, water-soluble, and polar medications move across the membrane through transport proteins like channels and carrier proteins. Passive diffusion helps small, lipid-soluble, and nonpolar medications move across the membrane from an area of high concentration to low concentration but sometimes the medication needs to be transported against their concentration gradient. This involves specific carrier proteins that use ATP as a fuel to pump medications into the cell. Now, sometimes medication molecules are so large that the cell resorts to bulk transport, also known as endocytosis, where the cell membrane invaginates and swallows up the medication, forming vesicles. Now, the rate of absorption, or how quickly this process occurs, as well as the extent of the absorption, or how much of that medication reaches the bloodstream, depend on several factors. One of them is the pH of the environment where absorption takes place. Most medications are either weak acids or weak bases, and can exist in an uncharged or charged form. The uncharged form is the lipid-soluble nonpolar one, which happily diffuses through the cell membrane, while the charged form is water-soluble and polar, and thus cannot diffuse through the cell membrane easily. The ratio between the two forms is determined by the pH of the environment and the strength of the weak acid or base. The strength is measured by pKa, which is the pH value when concentrations of the uncharged and charged forms equal each other. So when the charged form of a weak acid, A-, shows up in an acidic environment with a lower pH and plenty of hydrogen ions around, it will grab one of them and turn it into its uncharged form, HA. HA can then be readily absorbed across the cell membrane. On the flip side, if the charged form of a weak base, BH+, is placed into an alkaline environment with a higher pH, and a lack of hydrogen ions, it's going to give up its own hydrogen ion and become an uncharged B. It can then pass through the cell membrane just like HA. So, in other words, weak acid medications can be better absorbed in an acidic environment, like the proximal duodenum, in contrast to weak basic medications, which are more likely to get absorbed in an alkaline environment, like the distal ileum of the small intestine. Keep in mind that even though the stomach is acidic, it's not suitable for the absorption of even weak acids, mainly because of its thick mucus layer. Another factor influencing absorption is the surface area available. A good place for absorption is the small intestine, with its circular folds, villi, and microvilli 
The total surface is actually about 250 square meters, the size of a tennis court. Other factors also include the blood supply to the absorption site and the presence of food or other material in the gastrointestinal tract that can either promote or inhibit absorption. A practical measure of absorption is bioavailability. Bioavailability is actually the proportion of the medication that eventually reaches the circulation. For example, if someone takes 100 mg of aspirin orally and only 60 mg of this is absorbed into the circulation, the bioavailability is 0.6 or 60%. Alright, so once the absorption has been completed, we're ready for the distribution of the medication. Distribution is the movement of a medication from the circulation into the body tissues. Once again, the rate and extent of distribution depends on several factors. One of them is blood flow to different tissues. Medications will be more rapidly distributed to body tissues that receive large amounts of blood flow, like the brain, liver, and kidneys, and less to the tissues with poor blood flow, like the skin and adipose tissue. But, for any medication to enter the brain itself, it has to go through the so-called blood-brain barrier, which is strictly regulated. Think of the blood-brain barrier as the brain's bouncer, <laughs> a highly selective membrane that turns away large, water-soluble medications that are floating around in the blood, while letting in smaller, fat-soluble medication. Next, another factor affecting distribution is the degree of plasma protein binding. In the plasma, medications travel partly bound to plasma proteins, like albumin, and partly unbound, or free. But only the unbound fraction is free to diffuse to tissues, whereas medication molecules that are bound by large proteins remain limited to the plasma, acting as a kind of reservoir. Finally, an important concept to remember is the apparent volume of distribution, or VD, of a medication which is used to represent how extensively a medication is distributed throughout the body. So, let's say we inject 100 milligrams of a medication into the blood, and none of it is excreted. Then, an hour later, we find the plasma concentration is 50 milligrams per liter. To calculate the apparent volume of distribution, we need to divide the dose administered, in milligrams, by the plasma concentration of the medication, in milligrams per liter. So, we get 100 divided by 50 to get a VD of 2 liters. The thing here is that we assume that the medication is distributed evenly throughout the body, although that's not the case for most medications. In any case, it's safe to say that medications with a rather small apparent volume of distribution, such as 3 liters or less, remain mainly in the plasma. Medications with an apparent volume of distribution of 16 liters or more get distributed throughout the extracellular fluid, meaning both the plasma and interstitial fluid compartments. And medications with an apparent volume of distribution of 46 liters or more are possibly distributed throughout all body compartments. Alright, as a quick recap. Absorption refers to the movement of medication from the site of administration into the circulation. It can occur through passive diffusion, facilitated diffusion, active transport, and endocytosis, and is determined by the route of administration, the pH of the environment, the chemical properties of the medication, the surface area and blood supply of the absorptive surface, the amount of contact time with the absorptive surface, and the presence of food or other medications in the gastrointestinal tract. Bioavailability is a measure of the absorption, and distribution is the movement of a medication from the circulation into the body's tissues, which depends on blood flow to tissues, capillary permeability, and plasma protein binding. The apparent volume of a distribution is a measure of the extent of the distribution.